Hey there, fellow DMs, I am Pruitt, and alongside me is noted Matt Mercer, hair plagiarist Jim Davis. Um, and in that regard, when it comes to making your NPCs better, we can't all rely on a wide repertoire of voices and uh, voice work. So you gotta you gotta dig down, find out what they're really what they're really into, what they want to do, and that way you as a DM can figure out how you would like to do this. It's making NPCs better on Web DM. This week's episode is sponsored by Hero Forge. They're the masters of customizable miniatures. If you've never played with their online 3D character creator, you are missing out. They've got so many options, including new color printing. You can make your character exactly the way you want it, and they come out looking great. Go to HeroForge.com to start designing your custom miniatures. And check out their Black Friday deals live now through Monday 1130. All STL downloads are $3.99, or you use the code EPICLOOT to get $5 off any physical mini. Go to HeroForge.com now. Link in the description. Okay, Jim. Mm -hmm. Today we're talking about NPCs and ways to make them better. Yeah. If we don't want to do what the Alliance did with Miranda, how do we make NPCs better? How do we make them better? <laughs> how do we make them? Certainly not by chemicals or anything. So I, to me, when, I, when we're saying like make them better, I, I'm speaking specifically from a place of like to make them come alive at the table to make them a yeah. part of the world and, and to have it be something that like the players can interact with, have it be a personality fully fleshed out. Um, not in the same way a PC is, but in a more than just a combat stat block sense. And mm -hmm. so when I think of something, you know, like this, I'm, I'm referring to like what I've come to call a play sheet that this is the, when I have an NPC, I bring this out and it lets me just like see the information that I want to see very quickly to let me portray them as, as uh, evocatively as possible. And I try to blend like role playing stuff with, with the stats for you know whatever system I'm really running in. But if it's like fifth edition, then like what are some of their, you know, ability scores? What are some maybe passive like insight that they might have or something? What's their T-Biff? <laughs> right. Yeah. They're, yeah. Their T-Biff. <laughs> um, and, you know, for me, uh, these sort of constraints of like including the mechanics and, um, uh, you know, mannerisms, gestures, personality type, like they fuel creativity for me. I know that some DMs like they just want to wing everything and have all options on the table. I, I find that I, I flourish more under circumstances where I have set my boundaries and like, okay, this is where I'm at. Um, and, I also like to include an element of surprise in them. So part of having that play sheet is having, say, if something on there is optional. But really, the the main reason why I use a play sheet and the main reason why I, I find that this enhances my NPCs and makes them better is because it removes my bias somewhat from playing mm -hmm. this NPC. Like if I'm playing, especially when I'm playing with the same group of players for a long time running games for them, I'm going to develop a type of bias for what they want to do. And it could be like negative in the sense of like, you guys have gone away with way too much in the past, or I've seen it all before. You guys just have another wacky scheme in mind that, uh, mm -hmm. that's going to fall apart in, or, as soon as initiatives rolled. Like it could be like in that sense. So I make things harder for you, or it can be a sense of like, I really like y'all's characters guys. And I like the fact that y'all come over here and we're hanging out. Like, I love this. This is great. Oh yeah, sure. Don't even worry about it. You know, you don't even have to roll like that sort of overly encouragement of, of the players, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, their characters and how easily they move through the world. Um, I want to remove those biases. I want this NPC to come to life as their own personality. And so having a play sheet reminds me of like, no, they will go for the throat. They will not hold back when they retaliate. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where I'm coming from with this. Yeah, I, I, I tend to have that problem too. Whenever uh, I, I don't have a, a fully fleshed out NPC, at least in my earlier DMing, GMing days, you tend to lean on like more your own personality. So for me, I would my NPCs would become kind of devil's advocate not not arguing, mm -hmm. but like arguing points, but also being a smart ass, like just just constantly. You can just guarantee that that shopkeeper is gonna 
argue with you over that yeah and then throw a cork uh, you know a, a, a sly comment in there that might piss you off yeah i don't know uh but yeah i'm 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 kind of the same way i don't i don't do a, like a like a full workup sheet i usually have just like four or five bits of info on there mm. that gives me like you said the boundaries you're starting here this is as far as i'll go either way yeah and there's maybe a little secret in there but this is this plus this is this npc yeah yeah it's very much a maximalist approach to portraying an npc right like i think the minimalist is i you know i know maybe two or three things about the npc and i'm just going to go with it you know mm -hmm. um and but it's not maximalist in the sense that it's a lot of background stuff that might not come up in play like lots of lore and backstory and things like that it's expressed through the play sheet but it's not integral to it so it's not mm -hmm. stuff that's gonna potentially never come into play like everything on the play sheet is like all right there is a reason that this is here and it's for yeah. use in session. Um, but it is a lot. And depending on what my goals are for an NPC, I, I will drop certain things, include, you know, or emphasize others more. Um, and of course, depending on the system, you know, there might be more mechanical widgets uh, or the like, but this is really a very system neutral or system agnostic approach mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to just like portraying an NPC, having them be a part of the world and a force in their own right. Okay, well, uh, let's let's uh, let's upgrade all those DMs operating systems out there with uh, more functional widgets. Then let's let's go through your 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 prompts here that you have for your uh, your play sheet. Yeah, what's what's first on your list that you worry about? So first on my list when I'm uh, when I'm thinking of of my play sheet is like I want role playing prompts. In the moment, mm -hmm. when I'm portraying this NPC, I'm going to be thinking about a lot of different things. And uh, usually uh, at this point, I'll create them on like a small card or, or something like that. You know, if I'm using a DM screen, I'll pin to the back of it or just have in front of me, even if I'm you know, running an online game. And the idea here is to uh, be able to evocatively portray the character. So I want personality, demeanor, something like that. Are they overbearing? Are they, uh, you know, do they speak softly? Are they kind of timid and in, or, or are they introverted? Are they more outgoing? Like, what is it about their demeanor and personality that's notable? Um, mm -hmm. Another might be gestures and mannerisms. You know, I, I find especially for online games, some sort of hand gesture that, that gets up in the camera or like, like leaning forward, leaning back. Um, that those can be as evocative as like standing up at a table and menacing or arms back something, you know, but, uh, um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> mannerisms and gestures are just as important, uh, in this case, next one might be any notable features, ticks, quirks, you know, do they repeat the same word a lot? Do they, you know, emphasize things with a snort or, a, or just a nose grunt, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. what is it that they might do that's notable? <laughs> <laughs> yes it, are they like the witcher where they're only monosyllabic yeah mm. right exactly uh, yeah mm. uh, yep fuck. um <laughs> and all of these these are prompts right to, to portray your character uh, evocatively um the big one is of course their voice uh -oh. and like their presence right how how they are portrayed yeah. and i think we've mentioned before on the show that I went the good, I don't know, <laughs> couple of decades in playing where I don't think I ever spoke in character as a DM for an NPC. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it was always summary and, and like, here's the information that they want to get. Here's what they say. I think sometimes I would, but it'd be a little weird or awkward. It was never with like a specific voice you know no no you yeah you would never uh no you would speak in first person for for villains and npcs sometimes okay. uh, especially later on but you never did voices it was more about tone yeah, yeah like for me it was you would tone. adopt yeah if they were more angry you would you would get a deeper it was obvious mm -hmm. right it's it, it, you did the like audiobook version of voices where a good audiobook reader won't necessarily do full on voices, but you can definitely tell the difference between male, female characters, aggressive, timid characters. Yeah, that was that was how I that was how I felt most comfortable portraying them, right? I I I didn't see anything more being needed. Uh yeah. and, and usually the if I can recall now sort of really thinking about it, <clears throat> the first person sort of speaking as an NPC 
would usually come in like the big important moments right so i'm not you know little npcs like minor uh, you know extras and the like i don't think they'd get that treatment but like the big ones the one that were recurring npcs or or ones that were important in the setting um would generally get something uh, but tone uh intonation the words you use how you you know the cadence of them like first off those are elements of how you <laughs> develop unique voices right uh yeah but not everybody needs to be matt mercer <laughs> sure uh but um it can sort of like go a little a little bit goes a long way because i think what i'm trying to say yeah. uh about it um but it, it's a it's something that's come up recently right like i think it's it that's what surprised me most about fifth edition and like returning to D D that I was like, oh yeah, I think there's something that's changed in the play style and, and the interactions between PCs and NPCs is much more intimate and immediate than when I, I mm -hmm. recall playing. Well, definitely. I think, uh, as we've been exposed to more like online gaming and, and how other people portray it, especially when you want to talk about for entertainment purposes, the 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 desire to do more first person like i'm playing this character as a pc therefore the dm feels the need to play care play their own npcs as evocatively like it's something that like uh, same way like i never i never did like crazy voices i think i would do some sort of uh in my early dming days but yeah. certainly once once i started gaming uh online like i do try to do as crazy of voices as possible because <laughs> it's <laughs> kind of who I've always been. I've always been like more of like an actor type. Like I love doing that yeah. and to just finally be like, well, yeah, why haven't I been doing this the whole time? Yeah. yeah. Um, and just like set that tiger free. Don't, don't cage it. Just let it go. And who cares if it, you know, you know, people are, don't like your voices. Just try a different Sh ones. Sure. I mean, well, number one, <laughs> it, they don't have to be perfect. You know, and a bad voice, one that's like a bad imitation or a bad accent of something can be yeah. just as evocative and, you know, just play it straight. What For me, whatever comes out of my mouth is what I'm going with. And you'll be lucky to get it the same way twice. Like I have to keep yeah. playing an NPC multiple times every time we play to really get it down. And I usually get into it by having a catchphrase that I'll just say to myself something that's come yeah. up in those sessions, right? Like a way I phrased something or some, the way I said it to, to be able to recall that. Um, but that's something mm -hmm. I've only really developed recently. Although I found with playing online and not even necessarily streaming, but just playing online that having a unique voice, even if it wasn't like a fully realized, uh, you know, uh, voice, but having something different about it, doing something more than just tone, and and you know cadence uh was very helpful because i the way i remember portraying my npcs was from a standing position like i love mm -hmm. standing and dming it helps me keep yeah. my energy up it helps me uh you know be more engaged with the game um and one of the benefits i saw of it was it's easy to play an NPC. I can stand back, be standoffish. I can cross my arms. I can put them hands on my hips. I can lean forward. Like a lot of that embodiment, that physicality was lost in, uh, in an online game. And so I find in that sense, like having to find new ways and learning to, to use the silly voices, as they say, um, mm -hmm. was an asset. And then when I've played in person since then, these last few years, I've never met anyone that it, when I start doing in character voices and speaking a character who was like, screw this, this is stupid. Like in many ways it yeah. kind of breaks the ice and is encouraging to others to have someone mm -hmm. at the table. Who's like, yeah, I, I don't care if this seems weird or, or, or cringe or whatever. Like I'm playing the game. I'm playing it the way I want to, um, yeah. can help people, uh, get on board with that. Yeah, definitely. As the DM, it does give everyone, especially, like I said, at a convention where some people might be a little bit more hesitant to open up, like being just boisterous and boisterous, which is I, the, the, the word I just I invented. I like it. Okay. I uh, like it. Like the first time I had my, my uh, beholder that's a bartender, like I really hadn't planned on making him Sean Connery. R. And R. then when they finally walked in, and then I was like, please come down, have a shape, <laughs> have a ship. You know, like like I just... It was it. Yeah. R.I.P. Sean. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
but that's the thing, like you're saying, like sometimes, like don't don't really like worry about the voice beforehand. I mean, obviously there are some NPCs. Yeah, you want them to be specifically like this, very very reserved, very mm, you know. But uh, there are some that just like just wait till your mouth opens yeah. and wait for that moment. How do you feel at that moment? What comes out? Yeah, uh, yeah. I found that I've developed about <clears throat> six or so stock voices. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got my monster voice. I've got my nobility voice. I've got my ruffian voice, you know, and uh, most of those are just very minor, slight, like, am I talking out of my throat? Am I talking out of my nose? Am yeah. I, you know, am are my, is my jaw forward? Is it back? You know, how, what's my posture like? And like, it helps me get into character as well, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, uh, put the, that's how I, I put the slight, the slight British crisp accent on it. Yeah. Yeah. On whether they're a villain or a Ponzi noble. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That is a good way to, to, uh, to think of it. I find with accents, the, that less is more that, oh, yeah. the, that it doesn't need to be laid on thick. And that sometimes, you know, using an accent is a good way to express something in game or in character about them. Like, if they're mm-hmm. villains, then they're British. Uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you, Star Wars. <laughs> Thank you, Star Wars. Um, but uh, part of what goes along with, like, you know, uh, personification and voice is, like, their interaction style to begin with, right? Are they berating? Oh, yeah. Are they mm-hmm. silent? Are they, you know, monosyllabic, like you're saying? Uh, mm-hmm. What is it like to interact with them? Um, that's going to be another big, uh, you know, just a, a big point to consider and as important, I think, to embodying the NPC as, as anything else, right? Like, oh, almost oh, definitely. One thing that I do whenever I know I have NPCs that could possibly be villains, like whether or not they are in, in secret or I can see that they can be turned, like they aren't exactly, uh, on board with what the PCs are doing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> using overusing the pc's names like as if to say i know exactly who you are oh yeah you know actually using their name in every sentence yeah to reinforce that i know who you are and i've got it i've got a list in my head Mm -hmm. and i won't i won't be dissuaded as to anything versus uh you know those 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 NPCs that are just kind of carefree and just like, Oh, what was your name again? And right. just, you know, like, <laughs> and maybe they're good guys, but the PCs constantly having to remind them who they are might yeah. throw in a little bit of a curveball, And so they, they, they'll be suspicious of the people they should trust. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's just, that's, that's one little like interaction quirk that I've kind of developed and like to use, uh, you know, to bring them to life to bring them Mm -hmm. to life yeah i i tend to go with the medieval humors and i find that the medieval humors are a great uh source for npc interaction because there's only four of them they're pretty iconic in in just their Mm -hmm. portrayal you know uh, an npc that's sanguine is a lot more just accommodating and you know supportive go along whereas a choleric uh uh you know npc is just belligerent stubborn you know uh and so like thinking and ter- first off there it's medieval thinking so if i'm playing a yeah. fantasy game it gets me in in sort of yep. a medieval mindset <laughs> uh and they're just they're they're four archetypal and easily recognized but still versatile enough personality types that um they, they serve as a good basis for you know just a quick i can read it all right <laughs> they're melancholic okay that's all i need to know uh, <laughs> uh let's go smash some pumpkins <laughs> right. sorry um and then if I, I i include something in the rp prompts um depending on what kind of game i'm playing and if this is a game that's heavy on social intrigue that's heavy on getting secrets out of npcs or engaging them in in conversations to like either Get, gather information or persuade them of something i will include what i've called deflections these are things that mm. the npcs might do to brush this off oh don't even worry about this you know the, you know and, and some of this requires like anticipating what it is that the players are going to talk about as a dm you usually know what it is that the players are are seeking an npc out you know what they're wanting for 
so I will say things like, oh, that, that incident that's vaguely connected to me, what are you talking about? This is clearly a misunderstanding or one of my insubordinates, you know, something that will maybe placate the PCs, but at the very least is a stalling tactic from the NPC. Yeah. You know, they got caught off guard. Uh, and I find that having those handy and on like a little card or something right there, like makes those interactions much more fluid. And so when it, when I can just have a deflection, just loaded and ready to go, as opposed to saying like, oh, well, they, they him and haw for a bit. And maybe they say something like this, like that's kind of breaking the, the narrative, breaking the, the, you know, the, the insetting yeah. immersiveness. Um, so I just like having them there. Oh yeah, uh, especially uh, especially if you have your deflection, like oh that's an interesting point. Let me get with my people and I'll get yeah. back to you. Yes, like that's a solo one because then as a as a as a DM, you've placated them. Hey, they didn't know, but they're gonna find out and get back to you. Uh -huh. They're never gonna find they're out never and gonna get back out. to you. <laughs> but whether or not the players pick up on that, uh -huh. uh, but yeah, like like uh, and the other thing is it's a classic, you know, projectionism or. Uh, 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 deflecting to a minor or a subordinate yeah, yeah. that's just that's just oh yeah i think my uh my stable hand was uh involved in that somehow you mm. should go ask him yeah yeah and then the, throwing somebody they're under the sneaking bus. out the back of the tower uh -huh. <laughs> there's all kinds of things you can get up to here with deflections and, and a lot of it is like how much do you want to annoy your players you know yeah. like it's easy to to set up an npc that's just constantly evading uh questions and the like and maybe it's super frustrating to put up with <laughs> Mm -hmm. um but uh moving on from role-playing prompts the next thing that's on my play sheet uh and this is where i find that a full play sheet like i set this thing down in front of me uh landscape style um are the characteristics these are yeah. qualities about the npc or things about them that are good for scheming brilliant little schemes right you, you know say. like <laughs> these describe the <clears throat> the npcs like ultimate or long-term goals um yeah. there's all kinds of things like what are, what are their motivations what do they not want what do they want you know um and so like I, this is really useful for determining like how does an npc react you know how do they behave in the world that i've set up when the players aren't doing anything interacting with them What's the NPC getting up to? And that's what these characteristics are for. Um, they inform role playing. Like, you know, you can look to these to get a better idea of how you should role play or react to a situation. And then they also like, because they spur in game moments, they interact with the system potentially really well. And so mm -hmm. they kind of occupy this middle ground between pure RP and pure statistics, uh, game stats that I kind of like. They're, they're fun. Oh, well, you could you could definitely uh, create like a little graph, right? Mm -hmm. Where you mm -hmm. your your NPC is starting at zero and your X axis is their goal. Are they closer to the goal or are they away from it? Oh yeah. And then the Y yeah. axis could be their relationship with the party mm -hmm, mm -hmm. therefore is it positive are they going up here towards their goal or negative like what kind of npc are they right and how well uh is the party interacting with their motivations and goals yeah yeah uh you know there's so many different ways to do that um but you know like we were saying earlier as long as you have those boundaries of what they're willing to do and what they're going what they're attempting to to get yeah and and they'll function anywhere in that like <laughs> yeah as long as you have the boundaries in place everything else is all play right right yeah this that, and that's what this is for you know by by making these explicit and <clears throat> for me i just use quick bullet points you know <clears throat> if i'm thinking about motivations and goals it's just like quick as uh, you know as quickly as i can or shorthand rather not as quickly um but it is about like keeping things focused and, and making sure that I'm doing the NPC justice. That's why it's worth writing all these out. Um, so speaking of motivations and goals, what is it that drives them? Why do they get out of bed? Why do they do what they do? And then what is it that they want to do? What are, and mm -hmm. I might have short-term goals, might have long-term goals. As closely as these goals can align to what the players are doing, the better, right? That's going to put them on a collision course with this NPC. And in that sense, this is how they're going to drive play. Um, and then their motivations inform interactions with the NPC or with the PCs, uh, how they move about the world, what kind of things they're willing to get up to. 
Um, yeah. Uh, a list of wants and not wants. <laughs> you know, they do not want these things. They might be related to the goals and motivations. They might not be. Um, you know, perhaps things that, yeah, that might be a front. It could be a front, right? Yeah. What they don't yeah. want might not be related to it at all. And that represents a way for the players uh, to kind of come at the NPC from a different angle. Of course, finding out what they don't want is a challenge in and of itself. But like, th that's why it's worth it to create this play sheet, because then that opens up the possibility of this style of play of like figuring these things out. Um, if I'm talking D and D, I'm gonna have their alignment, their ideals, their bonds, and flaws. Like I, I love alignments for NPCs. You know, mm -hmm. um, they're great for just a shorthand of for a lot of this. You know. Um, oh yeah. And then their ideals, bonds, and flaws they they inform a lot of this. Uh, a lot of the say the motivations, what they want, what they don't want. Uh, well, you know. I, I will say fifth edition and the addition of the the traits, ideals, bonds, flaws is a great shorthand if you use it properly mm -hmm. as far as for your npcs right it goes a long way to to give you this info information at, at, at a shorthand i don't really do like a full like sentence mm -hmm. for my npcs but i do usually use that template yeah because it it, it is a great shorthand for for you know uh, at a glance, be like, "Oh, right, they, that is their flaw." <laughs> so they would fall for this ploy that the in, that the players are doing. Yeah, you know, a drinking contest. They love the drink. Yes, and so of course they're <laughs> having their honor challenge. Yeah, I'll sit with you shot for shot, and now you can maybe get that NPC to start spilling some beans. Yes, you know. Yeah, yeah. Knowing what they knowing what they are going to fall for, and mm -hmm. and what are their sort of like avenues of approach is going to be really important. Having them written down is obviously good. Um, I would say with fifth edition, the stuff in the DMG, the ideals, bonds and flaws tables in the uh, chapter four, those are serviceable, like start out with them, but there's not a lot of options and they're kind of generic. Um, yeah. Expand. Yeah. What I would have <laughs> loved to see is like the, uh, so there are these devil and demon more uh, motivation tables and ideals and bonds and flaws in uh, modern kinds. And I would have loved to have seen just a generic set of monster stats for this. Like, the, you know, what is it that monsters hold I as ideals or bonds? Um, mm -hmm. So, like, think about how they relate to the sort of NPC you're creating. Uh, you know, is this a dragon? Is this a beholder? Um, how might it be different than than like what a mortal <laughs> might have for these uh, these qualities? Yeah. Um, so another four. Uh, for the characteristics that an NPC might have are just their secrets. What do they know that might be valuable? Right. Oh yeah. Oh, they, Hey, the, the secrets in like in, in most popular, you know, media, that's the thing, you know, in John wick, uh, he was only really pissed. The, the, the main guy when John burned all of his blackmail, <laughs> all of the secrets that he had garnered. Cause yeah. that's power. That's power. Yeah. Right. If you can learn what the big bad, like, or, or just the, the, in, the big NPC you're dealing with, if you can learn the things that they know about people, oh, well, you're taking their leverage away. Yeah. Like, that's just, ah, uh, that's, that's, mm. Some good stuff. You can kill them, sure, but uh, <laughs> to unmake them, that's the other thing. Yes, yeah, to really hit them where it hurts, you know, and, and secrets could be of that variety of, like, this is, this is a resource that the NPC will utilize. So taking it away or, or neutralizing mm -hmm. it somehow is, is a, uh, is going to be a factor in them, but it could also just be things that the NPC knows that the PCs don't yet, right? It could be lore for how to defeat the monster or how to conduct the spell or, or who should I talk to, to begin this, you know, you know, influencing this other NPC or something like that. And, if you just think of secrets as like, oh, the players just don't know this yet. Their characters don't know this yet. Um, and then maybe include something in it about what are the conditions under which this might be revealed. And that kind of ties into responses and retaliations, which is another category I'll sometimes um, come up with, which one of the responses might be reveals a secret, um, you know, clues them in on something, introduces them to another NPC. Um, if, if this were powered by the apocalypse, uh, you know, uh, uh, game aid, these would be what are called hard moves. These are things yeah. that the NPC will do directly to the PC's actions. They are retaliations and responses to PC actions. You know, 
when the players first hit the the you know the underworld bosses a crime syndicate or whatever uh what's their retaliation like what's the what's their first response like um and again this is where by having this put down earlier you can anticipate and sort of think this through as opposed to doing it in the moment and like remove some of that bias really give it time to like oh yeah if they do this this is how this guy's gonna strike back you know this mm -hmm. is what it looks like um it's worth yeah, first he's, keeping track of all that. What's that? <laughs> yeah, first, he, first he's going to try to hire them. Right, yeah. It's, just a, <laughs> it's the best way to get rid of a problem. You just start paying them more. Right, yeah. Right. Can I just buy you guys off? You know, is that is that an option here? And maybe it is, you know. Maybe if it shows up with a bunch of magic items and some gold or something like that, whatever that is the PCs really want, um, mm -hmm. then maybe they do. Maybe they have to yeah. deal with that moral compromise. <laughs> yeah if he's if he's found out the secrets of what they really want oh you, you're trying to find your people i have a map you yeah, know that right yeah i've got i've got that I could, information I could help you yeah that's <laughs> a, that's especially like using that style of play in the opposite direction like where the piece the npcs are trying to figure out things about the pcs like how can they do yeah. that how do you pump a pc for information or you know get them to reveal it to you surreptitiously in a conversation um that's maybe a different show, but it's worth thinking about uh, if you're going to mm -hmm. run a really social intrigue heavy game. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The responses retaliation is going to be one of the more important parts. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. How do they get this information? Are they reading your mind? Do they just get it, get it out of you as you're talking? Do they Sherlock Holmes it, uh, do, you know, deduce mm -hmm. it from from your actions? You know, how do they do it? You have the pollen of a very specific plant that is only in this cemetery. <laughs> I followed you and I saw the gravestone of your mother. <laughs> right. Like, like, like that like, kind of thing. It's like, geez, man, like that's super involved. <laughs> get a, get a life. Dude. Right. Or does their familiar follow them around and get a yeah. feel for what it is that they do and what they like? Like there's a lot of different ways that, uh, that they might respond. And I think gathering information first is one way to do it. They might just retaliate with violence, you know, and that might be another way in which they, you know, are unique and stand out as uh, as part of the uh, the setting most definitely um so as we as we move along here uh in your in in your little uh your your your, your play sheet here uh -huh. um obviously npcs there's going to be a lot of interaction with players yeah so how do you how do you like to to lay out uh so to speak their 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 social stats mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah this this would be the section that I would I'd call is the closest or I'd say is the closest to their combat stat block. This is where mm -hmm. we, we really just uh, lay out what the game mechanics are that surround the uh, the NPC. And it's, it's primarily there for helping us resolve actions uh, with them. So speaking from a fifth edition perspective, but again, this is largely system agnostic. Um, I would look at what their ability check DCs are right. This might uh, require checking out their starting attitude. You know, what's what's what is their initial disposition towards the PCs, because that will determine the persuasion uh, uh, checks needed to kind of like influence them. Um, but beyond that, I would have, uh, you know, something noting their passive deception, something noted their their passive insight for NPCs. I try to create as many um, like non variables as I can, you know, just to keep the keep it. I don't know. Keep it as seamless well, as possible. The... My goal when I'm role playing a scene <clears throat> is to break that immersion as little as possible and yeah. and let the conversation play out and and decide at the end of it, uh, you know, whether a role is even needed or not. Um, but use my passive scores to inform how the NPC like responds in that moment. You know, how do, how do they like, is their passive insight kind of high? Are they really good at reading, you know, a, another person, the longer they talk to them, is their passive deception kind of low? Like they just are not good at casually lying. You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't usually like to roll off uh, in those cases um, just because I prefer that the player just do a quick roll, tell me what it is and we keep going. And I know that that's, even that extra step of like, okay, I had to roll, we're comparing, you know, uh, I don't, even that is too much for me. Just quick roll, what'd you get? Okay, let's keep going. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's where these things are. 
I, I pretty much function in a, in a very similar way. Uh, if if a play if the players are trying to get some information, they make their pitch. We have a conversation, and then there will be a roll just to see like, okay, well, you've pretty much won them over with your convo. Let's see how much info you get. Yeah, yeah. Did you pass? You're gonna get what you need, oh, sure. but not anything extra. Did you fail? Okay, you might get what you need, but it's gonna come at a cost. Yeah. Did you roll really well? Well, guess what? You're gonna get what you need. Plus a few extra tidbits that'll help you along the way a little bit easier, mm, mm. and so it's it's more on that. It's 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 the 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 way that they interact with the NPC will inform how much I'm willing to give them based off a roll. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good way to think about it too. Just to what is it that they're, the players can get from this? Why is it worth engaging with the mm -hmm. system in these moments? Uh, and and how do I resolve them? Because I, in addition to like not having bias or removing as much of my bias as possible. Like part of that and, and a complimentary to that is getting rid of as much DM fiat, just decision because yeah. of my whim. Like I can always do that. There is yeah. nothing about this process that's, that keeps me from going, this is what I want at this moment. But having these constraints that I, that I voluntarily put myself in, like I feel more emboldened in my portrayal of an NPC, when I tell myself, listen, they will always be like this, or this is the, these are the DCs that are needed because they're difficult to persuade. They're stubborn, right? Like having an embodiment of the game mechanics, as well as the reinforcement through role-playing prompts. Like to me, that's when I feel most satisfied, uh, you know, as a DM of how I've portrayed them. Um, so in addition to ability check stuff, I might put their actual stats down. Like what is their persuasion? What is their charisma? What's their intimidation? Anything like that. Um, I am going to note uh, sort of special qualities and traits. Do they have any magic yeah. that's relevant here? Any special items or anything, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. If, you, if you're going to go talk to Jarl Axel, uh, you're going to want to know <laughs> all that he can do as the DM playing that. Oh yeah, certainly right. Do they have a, a you know ability to not have their mind read? Do they have like some kind of mental defense? Do they yeah you know can their emotions be swayed? Right? Do they have something that prevents their emotions from being uh, from being altered? Uh, do they have some kind of defense against charm or something like that? Um, can they, you know, do they have a <laughs> glibness or something where they're just really good at lying? Um, and, you know, and how that comes across as, you know, in your interactions, that's a tough one to, to sort of answer. I, I, I take like how good of an NPC a liar is largely in terms of how much can I hide from the players in my portrayal? You know, like mm -hmm. in many ways, playing a character, an NPC that's very good at deception requires me to know my shit so that I can actually lie to the players as a person, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, the less that I stutter, stammer, have to think of things, then the easier it is for me to just pass this off as their legit answer and not trip up the players like DMs lying to us. You know, <laughs> yeah, the players in their passive insight to the DM's deception. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We don't need to get meta with with all the interactions, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. Another is like you know just having the 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 lies and and what their deflections and covers might be already written out or something. Um, I, I, or maybe you just don't care about any of that and you're fine telling the players like, oh yeah, they're just really good at lying. You can't tell, you know, and then mm -hmm. trust them not to metagame. Um, but if there's something from like their combat stat block that might be relevant here, I'll note it. You know, do they have some ability that might influence a social interaction um, that I'll pull from a combat stat block? Um, yeah. The other big thing, and I think you mentioned it earlier in kind of a progress track, is mm -hmm. I will note any clocks or countdowns that are associated with them, right? Oh, yeah. So without getting too much into it, a clock and countdown are two means that a DM can sort of track progress of in-game events. Clock is a countdown to a specific event. Um, you know, whatever it is that's going to happen, four ticks, eight ticks, six ticks. Uh, Blades in the Dark makes good use of these. Um, and then the other one is like a progress track where you track the individual steps of, of what's going to happen uh, either, you know, as this NPC accomplishes their goals, they start ticking off boxes on the track. 
you can combine them for every clock that fills up. They move one down the track or whatever. Um, but clocks could be anything. They could be, you know, how long until they, till they send someone after the, the PCs. And then every tick mm -hmm. of that is filled with, you know, specific actions that the PCs can take before they retaliate for the NPC retaliates, right. something like that. They're just here to give me an idea. Largely they're there to remind me, oh yeah, the NPC did want to do this, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, especially in a sandbox game. Uh, these, this is a really, uh, really going to help bring your setting to life. Almost definitely. I mean, and even you can use them in conversations. I mean, this could represent an NPC, the players beseeching a Sultan to allow them to do whatever. And maybe they say the wrong thing right at the beginning. Well, guess what? Now a clock starts of the Sultan losing his patience. Yes. Yeah. And every time you say something wrong or you make a roll and it doesn't roll come out well, guess what? That clock's starting to fill up. And when he loses his patience, out of there. he might just throw you in the dungeons for a day or so. Yeah. You know, and so you have to know, like, you know what? I feel the clock's running out. We're just going to go. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back later. It can inform the um, DM's role playing of that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, uh, the sort of the inverse of that is how much are the PCs affecting, like, and swaying the NPC? And yeah. if you're frustrated by or unsatisfied with, like, my super persuasion optimized rogue or bard, like, just keeps <laughs> overwhelming my poor NPCs, like, this is a good way of just being like, it's not going to take one of these. It's going to take work. You know, no, yeah. you can't just roll insight against them. You barely know them, right? Like, you're going to have to spend time with them in order to gain any insight into their behavior or, or their motives or whatever, you know. Um, and I think if you're looking to, like, really enhance and expand on the social pillars of your game, the social interaction, the NPC interaction, whatever, that having these supportive tools being able to fall back on the mechanics, being able to, you know, to, to look at your play sheet and go, nope, this is what I wanted. I'm, I'm, I'm getting caught up in the moment here for getting to portray my NPC the way I wanted them to. Um, like, that will make it much more satisfying than if the NPCs are just like cardboard stand-ins that, that don't really have a personality or, and can be persuaded with one role. That's less satisfying than like this. It's, it's another character. Or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's they're a part of the setting. They can't just be steamrolled. Um, it doesn't work for every game, but I I prefer this method in all in just about any game, uh, linear definitely. or open. I like this uh, as a player. I like interacting with this NPCs this way. Yeah, and um, just kind of um, rounding out the conversation here, mm -hmm. you've discussed uh, DM fiat or bias a lot. Yeah, and one way to circumvent that is with tables certainly yeah because you can just have tables for pretty much anything there's a lot of the, yes yeah there's a lot of it that can that can be reduced to tables and so having tables on the play sheet i i usually include some space on it for just miscellaneous some blanks blank mm -hmm. spot and that's usually where i'll include these and i use them in two ways i either make a play sheet for like a generic type of npc so if I was like, all right, Orc Warchief has this play sheet, and most of the information here is going to be short D4, D6 tables. So it's like they have D4 mannerisms, D6 goals, things like that. That's one way I use it. I, I've done that once so far, and I found it useful, but there weren't multiples of the, in, of the NPC to come up to justify needing <laughs> all the stuff that i put on the tables results. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I i haven't really used it since then um but what i have used uh, recently are tables that give that let me have some variety in the the context in which this npc is encountered or like w what it's like to encounter them in this moment um and so the the five that i use the most number one if you guys have watched uh, long and you know, long time viewers <laughs> will know that uh, I make use of the reaction table, um, a, a mechanic from classic D and D, rolling two D six uh, with each of the so there's like five categories within there that go from worst at two to absolute best at twelve. But the other break points are three and five, uh, six through nine or six through eight, and then nine through eleven. Um, gives you this nice spread provides enough variety 
that uh, if they're interacting with an NPC a lot, it can be beneficial. And you have a lot of control over what those categories mean and how those uh, brackets are situated. <clears throat> you know, you might do three categories, four, change them up, you know. And so I really like using this to determine starting attitude for, uh, for a first-time NPC. So starting attitude determines the initial DCs in 5th edition. And just roll a reaction. What's it like? What's their mood? How do they, what, what first impression do the PCs make? And to me, this is something that the PCs don't really have a say in. This is entirely the NPC. And mm -hmm. I'll use reaction rolls to, to see how an NPC reacts to a, you know, proposal put by the, the player characters to actions from them. And I've yet to find out a way to really get it to mesh well with the persuasion, intimidation, and deception roles. But especially for persuasion, I'm increasingly coming around on the idea, the idea of like, I don't know how that the players will have input in this, but I think that the final decision on who or in what circumstances an NPC will allow themselves to be persuaded, like that, that is part of that NPC. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, this is all weird. We're treating them like they're real people kind of thing, but there's something about it for me where I, you know, that's great. You rolled a 25 on your persuasion. They're not impressed. Like it doesn't matter. You could have rolled a 40. This is not the way that they're going to uh, be persuaded, you know? Um, so having a table really helps uh, with that for me. Yeah. See, I'm thinking uh, on a reaction roll table, two is disadvantage. Mm. 12 is advantage on that persuasion roll. Okay. Uh, if it's three through five, you maybe have like a minus three, and if it's mm. the other end of the of middle, it's plus three. Okay. But other than that, or maybe minus two plus two, and then if it comes in the middle, it's just nothing. You're, you're, you're just know, making a roll, the, yeah. The six through eight, you know, that's a straight roll. You could, but you, uh, you could. So, I, I I like that. Here's how I here's how I'd change that because I I like where you're going with it. Middle is like you're saying, just a straight roll. And then maybe the, the next brackets up and down are the disadvantage, advantage, mm -hmm. right? Three through five. And then the two is like, you don't even get your proficiency. <laughs> like you, it's cumulative too, right? Like you've yeah. got disadvantage and no proficiency. Like this is the worst possible outcome. Roll your raw charisma check, you know? Whereas like 12 might be, you double your proficiency. Like this is the best possible. Got expertise yeah, and yeah. advantage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just in this hey, one time. There you go. You know, and that might, that's a good, because it's like those two and 12 are going to come up so rarely. I want them to be big, you know? Uh, yeah, that is true. Yeah. The probabilities of it all. Yes. Uh, you could so, watch our uh, video on random table. <laughs> our most recent one. Uh, for yes, more of this, yeah. uh, so I, I'll have that. I after your random table table, right? <laughs> so, and that's where I keep all of them. <laughs> yes, my table of tables. Um, I, one of the things that I'll do with the reaction table is link it to personality and demeanor, or interaction mm -hmm. style. Right, like you can express oh, yeah. those things mechanically through the reaction table, and that's that can be pretty fun. Um, Mm -hmm. Another one is if I'm playing like an open world uh, kind of game, especially if it's like an open city where, you know, you're, you're just running around this one location um, is to have a where is the NPC at in this location, you know, table. Do they find them always in the same place like they're a video game <laughs> quest giver? Just there waiting for the exclamation just point. waiting there or, you know, might they have to hunt them down? You know, oh, nope, sorry. The NPC is in their study and asked not to be disturbed right now. Yeah, um, always in another castle. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're, yeah, they're, they're, not, they're visiting with somebody. Oh, yeah, of course. They're, you know, taking their afternoon tea out on the veranda or something. <laughs> uh, that if the, the players are going to interact with the NPC a lot, then this is just a nice way to provide a little variety. You know, mm -hmm. just a nice little way of saying, okay, this time you're in this part of his mansion or her wizard's tower or whatever, you know, um, you know, if you, if you're dealing with like, a you know, someone that's on the, on the road a lot. Okay. Well now they're, you know, it's less about the location. Now it's maybe it's more about the activity. They're making camp, they're packing up, they're brushing down their horse. They're, you know, cutting up some firewood or something. Um, location activity are one of those that 
they're not important. If I don't have space, if I don't need them, I might not include them. But I, I like to if I can. Just make a make a little change here and there, here and there. Yeah. Well, I mean, also it, uh, it, it this is a way to to give the players some information about the NPCs. Oh yeah. If they're always doing these certain activities at various locations, and you maybe need to find out a little bit more, now you're now's your opportunity. Well, we wanna we wanna try to shadow them for a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this is roll some dice. This is what this is where they go, and this is what they do when they get there. You know? Yeah, yeah. And you might not they even go out in the field. Yeah, you you might not even need a table for that. You might be like, okay, every other day they are always at this place, you know, or they mm -hmm. spend every morning at this place, and learning that information is key to like gaining access to the NPC, or or you know whatever. Um, so yeah, that's that's a really good point. Uh, if I've got space and I'm just feeling weird or just, or, or the, it's the kind of game where this would be beneficial. I might have like, who, who's fought, who's with them at this moment. Do they have an entourage? Mm. Do they have followers? Are they in someone's company? You know? Oh yeah. And in the same, the hangers on right, the hangers on. Yeah. Do they have any sycophants nearby? Is their bodyguard here? Are they completely alone or with they, are they with their family? Like in the same way that a combat encounter can be variable in terms of like, are, is the enemy aware of us? Are, are, are we aware of them? Maybe neither of us are. How far away are they? What are they doing? Is it the goblin fight club or the two goblins who are just getting drunk in the corner, right? Like <laughs> all of those things add variety and spice to a combat encounter. So why wouldn't I want that for my social encounters? You know, they, they give you a, a frame. All right. Well, my, the NPC is now at lunch with their family. <laughs> you know, yeah. is this the right time to talk to them about this thing? Um, yeah, it, it really helps to create a living world. Oh, yeah, it definitely. Because, uh, you know, sometimes you just all, all you need to do is get to someone in the entourage. Yes. Uh, you don't have to get to the main NPC, no. especially if there's some kind of like Godfather type figure yep. or, you know, the head of some kind of th group. Yeah, uh, you you get leverage on one, and that's a way to get information on the main guy yes. without doing it directly. So, yeah. it's you know, all it is is options, right? All it's, you're doing is providing options, avenues for information to be disseminated. Yes, yeah, and especially with like the finding ways in, finding a weak link, like mm -hmm. that is another way that you can really enhance an intrigue based game. You know, where it's like, okay, well, we've got to get the queen's ear. We've got to find a way to get this message to the queen. Well, we can't just go in there and talk to her, right? You can't just get an audience. You have to know someone. You have to have an in. Someone has to introduce you. You have to be a known quantity. Do you blackmail this courtier or this, you know, page or whatever to, uh, to gain you that access? Do you try to charm mm -hmm. them, become like, get to be their friend so that they introduce you voluntarily? You're just using them, you know, when you send in the bard, right? Is, is this on. where you send in the bard? <laughs> is this where they really are able to like shine and have their moments? The, the social focused rogue or, you know, the, the elegant courtier paladin, whatever, like this is their battlefield. This is where they are, you know, shine and being able to set these things up and having them, you know, be part of your world as opposed to like, we want to go talk to this NPC. Okay. Here's this NPC. And it's just like, it might as well take place on a blank comic book panel or something, you know, it's just not alive, not, not evocative, uh, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's why I like using these tables. And then I will always try to have something of what do they got on them? What's their loot? Yeah. You know, if worse comes to oh, worse definitely. and the party is looting their corpse, <laughs> then I want, I want it to be worth their trouble, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Because Hey, depending on where that uh, NPC, how important they are, if they have different, uh, if they have different fronts that they put up for different groups of people that they see, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, you want to hit them up when they're loaded up with the rings and the cufflinks yeah. and not when they're visiting the poor. So therefore they, they leave all that at home. They don't want to show off because they're dealing with the poor that day. Yeah. Like, no, you don't hit them that day. You hit them the day that they go see the Cardinal mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they're decked out, uh, yeah. in all of the golden fineries. <laughs> if that is the goal, if that's you know, the goal. But, yeah. That, what happened? Yeah. You know, I'm thinking of another one, like, what happens when you pickpocket them? Like, what can you mm -hmm. come on? Can you 
like, okay, we know that they've got the scroll we need on their person, you know, or we suspect it, you know, uh, let's go see if we can't pilfer it. <laughs> let's go see if we can't mm-hmm. like do one of those, uh, uh, you know, one, <laughs> one of those pickpockets that do it on stage, you know, where they're like, just bring an audience member and stand right here. I'm going to see how many things I can take out of your pockets or put in them without you noticing. Like if they're that brazen about it, that, then you might want to know, yeah, they got these things in their pockets. It doesn't have to be if they loot them. It could be for a lot of things. You know, they have this mm-hmm. on hand to give. They've, you know, I, I like having these things rather than just like coming up with them on the fly because when I'm a player and that happens every time, they happen to have exactly what we need. They happen to have, you know, whatever it is, the right moment. Like that breaks my sense of immersion. And that's what makes yeah. a game world feel like it's catering just to me. This is a theme park. And, and if I just, if I stepped over here behind the cutout, we would to be nothing. Whereas I, fi- I find it a satisfying experience for both the player and a DM side to be like, oh no, like we did our best to remove any of the background here. Like I, I know what's in their pocket because I wrote it down and I have it right here. I didn't want to wing it necessarily. I don't do this for every NPC, right? Like I might do this for three to four per campaign, you mm-hmm. know, at, at, you know, at most maybe no more than six. I, that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of work. <laughs> It's a lot. I mean, yeah, not for much benefit. Um, but, you know, faction patrons, uh, villains, you know, like long-term villains, uh, NPC allies, they'll get this treatment. Uh, the whole, you know, the whole shebang, all of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what would you say, just kind of rounding out the conversation here, Jim, what, you, what would you say is your favorite part of this kind of uh, NPC prep? What's the thing you look forward to the most? I look forward to the, the, what we refer to as the characteristics, the motivations, the goals, the secrets. Mm-hmm. Like, I like, I like a shorthand that helps me portray the NPC as evocatively as possible. Um, I like the interaction moments in game. But where I really get excited, where I really feel like I'm, I'm stepping into my NPC shoes is in the prep phase, right? It's when I'm looking at their sheet and going like, how will they retaliate here? How will they utilize some of their secrets against the NPC or against the party or maybe for them, right? It's, it's that moment where I get to respond to what the players are doing. And mm-hmm. the fact that it happens in prep, I, that's fine. I'm, I'm not playing the game at that moment. I'm creating it in some ways or, or facilitating future gameplay. So it's kind of this quasi solo game that you get to play with, you know, by yourself. Yeah. Uh, you get to write up all the dialogue prompts. Right. Yeah. Or, or, or you get to like, <laughs> so to speak. especially if you, have, well, you might, you might literally be writing up dialogue, uh, which sometimes as part of my portrayal, I'll do quotes or sayings or phrases that they might use a lot of, you know? Yeah. Um, I, that's mostly what I do is I'll just write a couple of quotes. Yeah. 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 Just to give them a embodiment. Yeah. Um, but then I, you know, I, I want to, I want to know how this character, uh, interacts with the world and if I'm also doing like a faction turn where I'm going through all the factions and looking and seeing how they're responding to the events of the world and furthering their own goals, then that just makes that part of prep more game-like for me. And I'll, that's where I use tables. I, I, you know, I'm like, all right, whatever I roll, I'm sticking to it um, as a way to like create a setup for the party to then interact with that flows organically from session to session. WebDM is powered by our Patreon community, the Web Demons. You can become a Web Demon for as little as two bucks a month, and that'll get you ad-free audio versions of everything we do. You can ask us questions that might show up on WebDM Talks, our Monday podcast available everywhere. For five bucks a month, we've got our Patreon podcast that comes out once a week. We go way into topics we don't have time to get into here. There's a lot more, too. Go check it out.